If we leave this magnificent room unified and determined to do what it takes to destroy the terror that threatens the world, then there is no limit to the great future our citizens will have. That is U.S. President Donald Trump, as you can detect by many of the crescent moons on the flags behind him. That was a speech he gave in Saudi Arabia in front of not only the Saudis, but a large meeting of other Muslim countries. He certainly sounded upbeat, but he also mentioned terrorism. How did his speech do? Donald Trump was very tough on terrorism on the campaign trail, along with his themes on China and Mexico and the wall, I'd say it was definitely in his list of priorities. Did he soften too much or did he get something in return? Did the great deal maker do deals that are good for America, the West, freedom and security? Well, joining us now via Skype to talk about this is our friend, Dr. Daniel Pipes, who is the president of the Middle East Forum. Great to see you again, Dr. Pipes. Good to see you, Ezra. Well, you watched this speech very carefully. Of course, you have been a student of uh, all matters Middle Eastern for many years, dating back to your time in Cairo, where you learned Arabic. What would you, uh, how would you compare Donald Trump's visit to the Arab world to other presidents, uh, most recently Barack Obama's, but others going back over the last half century? Well, not surprisingly, he's more unbuttoned. He talks more volubly. He is more emotional. This is not uh, the kind of careful speech that other presidents have given in similar circumstances. It's much more expansive. And we can find good things and bad things in that. Overall, I'd say uh, I wrote a piece that said that the, like, the talk given in, in Riyadh was pretty good. I was impressed by it. There were things I didn't like, but overall I thought it was good, in particular because he focused on Islamism, Islam. This is something that needs to be said. It needs to be said in Saudi Arabia. It needs to be said with some 50 leaders in the room. That was very important. Yeah. Well, we have your essay here called Trump's Saudi Speech, a mixed bag, but pretty good. I'd like to play you two clips from the speech. You refer to these clips in the essay. So let me uh, play them in Donald Trump's own words, and then maybe you can give me your thoughts on them. Here's the first one where, as you said, he uses the phrase Islamism and Islamist terrorists. Well, here, let's listen to him himself. Of course, there is still much work to be done. That means honestly confronting the crisis of Islamic extremism and the Islamists and Islamic terror of all kinds. We must stop what they're doing to inspire because they do nothing to inspire but kill. Well, I mean, it's ironic because, of course, Saudi Arabia has been a major funder of Wahhabi Islam, which I think everyone would acknowledge is extremist. Uh, Trump was in the room with these 50 Han shows. What do you think their reaction was? I think they weren't pleased by that because they like to pretend that ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the other horrible extremist groups are, in fact, not Muslim. This is a fiction that has developed. And here Trump comes along and says they are Muslim and there's no getting around it and he emphasized it in the clip he just played. And that, I thought that was the most important and best part of the speech. Now, uh, I, I want to play another clip of the speech, but before I do, uh, one of the important stories coming out of Trump's trip to Saudi Arabia was a massive arms deal, uh, more than $100 billion. Uh, you know, of course, Donald Trump has talked about bringing jobs and heavy industry back to America, but when you're selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, who knows how they're going to be used or for what purpose? Maybe to counter Iran, maybe to attack Yemen. I don't know. Uh, I don't know uh, if that was considered a win for Trump or like I, I don't know what the quid pro quo is. Trump was demanding they take action on Islamic extremism. Do you think they got anything from Trump in return? Or uh, what do you think? That, do you think that the economics and the politics and the religion were kept separate? Or what was the master deal here? Let's recall that the 110 billion is just part of a larger sum, which is 380 billion. It's not quite clear where that's going to be spent and how, but an absolutely gigantic amount of money, possibly the largest ever in any such uh, deal. So, in that sense, he is the deal maker. Uh, from an American perspective, I have my doubts. First of all, the Saudis have a long history, decades long history, of purchasing great big ticket items. Uh, planes in particular, but tanks and ships and you name it, the glossiest, the best 
but they have proven themselves incompetent for using them. Yeah. So uh, to a certain extent, one's not quite sure what all this amounts to in terms of defending Saudi Arabia. Secondly, one's not quite sure what they'll be used for. You mentioned Iran and Yemen. Let me add a third country, Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, the Saudis have not uh, turned against Israel, and they made an explicit promise they would not use these arms against Israel, but who knows? Uh, it has been known to happen that a regime is overthrown. So uh, it's an awful lot of hardware for a country that really has not shown its competence in using uh, weapons like this, and I, uh, I think it's just much too big. Yeah. I took a bit of a detour there because I wanted to see how that arms deal played into the puzzle. I'm not quite sure. But let me play the second clip from his Saudi speech. I thought this was interesting. And again, although the speech was in Saudi Arabia, it really was a meeting of all the Arab and Muslim leaders that the Saudis could put together. It was quite a magisterial event. I mean, to, to see the pomp and circumstance with which Trump was welcomed, it was quite something to behold. They treated him as if he were king. And I think Trump probably liked that. But listen to this part where he addresses yes. to the... Uh, the but, uh, they have a lot of gold in Saudi Arabia and a lot of gold in Trump Tower. So yeah, quite... yeah, that's right. I think they've got his aesthetic nailed. Here, take a look at this second clip. We can only overcome this evil if the forces of good are united and strong, and if everyone in this room does their fair share and fulfills their part of the burden. Uh, there was talk about some Arab NATO. That was one of the phrases I heard journalists bandy about. <laughs> Who will the Arab NATO fight against? Uh, will it fight against people we think are bad guys? Um, will it, I guess this goes to your last question. You got three hundred fifty billion dollars worth of military. You're putting together an Arab NATO. Trump says you got to fight. Fight whom? Well, he became more explicit about this today uh, in Israel, where he talked about Israel and the Arab states, meaning the Arab Sunni states, joining together against Iran. And he said that Iran is the vehicle by which Israel and the Arabs will work together. So Iran is clearly the opponent, and everybody is supposed to get together against Iran. Not a bad idea. Uh, not sure how feasible it is. The, the, there has been certainly progress in terms of Israel and the Arab Sunni states, but are they quite ready for what Donald Trump has in mind for them? We'll see. Well. I mean, I, I regard Iran as a mortal threat, not just to the region, but uh, perhaps to the world. Uh, however, they do have allies. Would you say that Vladimir Putin is an ally of Iran? And, and how do you think that final piece of the puzzle might be played? They are certainly, the Iranians and Russians are certainly allies at this point, but they have differing goals. Uh, the Iranians are Muslim fundamentalists. The Russians are anything but. Uh, so tactically, they have fair a number of concerns in common, but in the long term, they're not really going in the same direction. So Iran has allies, but and China too, uh, North Korea, but they're tactical allies. And in some sense, Iran is isolated. It has its friends in Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and Yemen and elsewhere, but it's pretty isolated. And so what Trump is trying to do is orchestrate a uh, massive... Uh, coalition against Iran. Everybody's feeling threatened by Iran in the Middle East, so it's plausible. But will they actually work together to the extent that he wishes them to? That's where I'm more skeptical. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I have not had a chance to look carefully at Trump's speech in Israel. Uh, we saw him there at the Holocaust Memorial called Yad Vashem. Earlier, he went to the Western Wall. I understand that was the first time a sitting U.S. president went to that Western Wall, which is symbolic, not just to acknowledge that the Jews have a claim to the old Jewish temple in Jerusalem, but even the fact that the wall is technically in what used to be called East Jerusalem. Um, those are important symbols. Would you like to say anything about the symbols of his trip to Israel so far or the substance of his speeches? The speech, the major speech he gave at the Israel Museum just some hours ago uh, was very warm. Uh, very warm. It uh, talked about love of Israel and it stated explicitly that Jerusalem is part of Israel. And so he went in directions that the Israelis are not used to hearing, especially over the last eight years of warmth. On the other hand, there was no move of the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, the Iran deal remains in place. And perhaps most important, uh, Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority has convinced Donald Trump that he is ready, so-called ready, quotes, ready for peace. Uh, I'm very skeptical. 
probably you're skeptical, certainly the Prime Minister of Israel is skeptical, and he made that skepticism clear. Uh, so that is an area of potential future friction, but for right now, the speech, which is not a policy speech, it was really an emotional speech, it was very warm, and precisely what the Israelis wanted to hear. Isn't that interesting? Well, let me uh, note uh, in closing that Prime Minister Netanyahu remarked to Donald Trump that his flight on Air Force One from Saudi Arabia to uh, Tel Aviv was perhaps the first ever recorded flight in that direction. And Netanyahu says, wouldn't it be nice to have a flight in the other direction one time too? It is interesting, Trump getting such a rapturous welcome in two countries that couldn't be more opposite Maybe he can uh, use some magical deal. I'm a skeptic, but he's off to a strong start. Would you agree with me on that, uh, Professor? I would say it's a good start. But for me, the most important thing is getting rid of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, known as the Iran deal. Uh, Donald Trump said he was going to do this first thing. He hasn't done anything about it. It's four months. I really want to see something there. That's the most important step, I would say. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, there you have it, Dr. Daniel Pipes, the president of the Middle East Forum. We'll keep in touch. I think this has been a very interesting few days, overshadowed by uh, uh, catastrophic terrorism in Manchester and other events, but something we'll certainly be talking about for a long time. Indeed. Thanks right. for the opportunity to chat. Thanks for joining us. That's an excerpt from my daily TV show, The Ezra Levant Show. Normally it's behind a paywall, but I thought you'd like this video, so we put it on YouTube. Uh, if you want to subscribe to watch The Daily Show every day, including always two interviews a day and I read my hate mail, just click on this screen and become a premium member.